Before this earth <coughs> passes away, there's going to be a rapture. Now the question this morning is, are you going up in that rapture? Probably by now, <coughs> everyone in America has heard of the rapture of the church, which uh, can happen at any time, they're saying. But one more thing that can happen at any time, you can die. Death can take us all by surprise. You might say, well, I had this to do, or I had that to do. I remember Larry saying one time when we was here working, this was years ago, he said, you know, I got too, much, too many things to do, I don't have time to die. He never lived a year longer after he said that. So in this message, you can get a good idea of whether or not you, yourself, will go up in the rapture. Or if you'll be able to make heaven your home when this life is over. Pay attention. The things are going to be here. I hope it's not hidden to your ears that you don't hear and understand the information will come from a book titled by the name of The Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Now, if you've never read that book, it's commonly called the Bible. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. And that's not just any book that we're talking about because there's a lot of books out there that claim to be a Bible. There's only one Bible today, and that's the authorized King James Version. And these perversions, none of them can carry that title. They are none of them the authorized edition. They are whatever. Some kind of man-made, put in man's terms Bible, I guess you could say. So they're more like a paraphrase. Like you read something, you say, well, this is what I think it means. That's what these perversions are. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for their memory is forgotten. So you know you're going to die. The Bible says you know you're going to die. Now just how long do you expect to be here on this earth? What are your thoughts on what's going to happen to you after this life, since you know that you're going to die, if the rapture doesn't take place before you die, you're going to die. This is not a maybe. This is just a matter of when. So just think about that. The Word of God gives us some insight into how long we should expect to live. Now he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 again in verse 17, Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? So a lot of people's not making the length of time that God says. In Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10, he says the days of our years are three score and ten. A score is twenty, so three score is sixty and ten makes seventy. And if by reason, by strength, they be fourscore, which would be eighty, yet is their strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Let me ask you today, how many people do you know that are in the 100-year-old club in here in America today? How many people do you know? Personally, I'm 78 years old myself. I know for a fact that I have a lot less years in front of me than what I had behind me. And probably, thinking on that, we look at the statistics 
And 95% of the people have not attained to the age that I am right now. But I'm pressing onward to God. What are you doing? The Bible says, well, let me add this first. If you think all these years that God has given me was because of the way I lived the first 40 years of my life, you might think again. Because if God had judged me, I would have already been burning in hell. And to tell you the truth, this second 40 that I'm into right now has not been with some failures on my part. But God has remained faithful and good, whether I am not or not, because He always is. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Doing what God says, he's going to prolong your days. I wonder if that's why some of the people are getting older and looking older a lot before their time. They don't want to do what God says, huh? They want to have it their way. I can tell you this lifestyle of boozing and drinking and all that kind of drugging, whatever you want to say, that people are doing today is shortening their lives. We know that for a fact. The Bible says that your days may be prolonged if you do what God says. In verse 5 he says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. How many people love the Lord today like that? Think about that. And verse 7 says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We need to think about what God has to say all the time, not just sometime, not just on the days we go to church, but every day. How many people do you know of today? I ask about the 100-year-old club. Now, that's how many's in the 120-year-old club? <laughs> how many people are living today that's 120 years old? I'm into my second 40 right now. In a couple months, I'll be, well, more, maybe three or four months, I'll be 79. And that'll be just shy of my second 40. Will I have a third 40? That would put me at 120. How many people do you know of that lives to 120? Think about that. When comparing this life to eternity, Seeing that we only have these few years. Think about it. Are you in the group that's going to heaven? Or well, ask yourself, do you really want to go to hell? There's only two places, heaven or hell. What do you do when you go to heaven? If you go to hell, you don't have to do nothing but keep living like you've been living. Rejecting Jesus, and you'll end up there. But when you compare this life with eternity, is there a comparison? How can you compare eternity with what? Less than 80 years? Because he said in the Psalms there, most of the people's lives are three score and ten. That's 70. But if by reason, by strength, you reach 80, it's soon gone. There's more people die <coughs> in that age bracket than any other people in the world. I wonder why. Is it because what God has written in His words? 
In Romans chapter 1, if you'll turn there, the Bible gives us a definition of what God has to say. He says in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. Now most people know to do what's right. But they don't do it, do they? They seem to always want to do the opposite. And most of the people who go to church today are not going to heaven. I don't know if you would realize that or not. But take a look at all them groups of people going to church on Sunday. The Bible makes it plain. Are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? In Revelation chapter 22, you ought to read this verse sometime. Verse 14. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, some teach of a soon happening of the rapture of the church. Now, if you believe that rapture is going to happen very soon and you're preparing to go up to heaven with the Lord, are you doing what that verse says? Because if you're not, then what gives you the right to enter into that city? What gives you the right to go to heaven if you're not doing what the Bible says to do? Oh, you might say, oh, I'm a born again Christian. Well, then ask yourself, why would God put that verse there? Since most people who are not Christians don't read the Bible, then do they? So it must be for Christians in love. And if God put it there for Christians and you're not doing it, then what gives you the right to get into God's heaven? <coughs> you know, it's plain as day for anyone to see. So why are these so-called pastors teaching something else? Why are they having church on Sunday instead of on the Lord's Day, the Sabbath? There it is. It's plain as a hand in front of your face. If you can read in Exodus, it says, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt... He tells you a whole lot of things you shouldn't do. And you say, Well, I'm not done none of that stuff. You're still going to hell because you're not doing this. You're not keeping His commandments. Which ones? Well, for one, you're not keeping the Sabbath, are you? You're going to church on Sunday. Don't you realize what you're doing to God? You're saying, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do what I want to do. I ain't doing what you say, God. I'm doing it my way. But God says, I'm not Burger King. You can't have it your way. You've got to do it my way or no way. <coughs> Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 again. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. And so what's the sacred read? So that they are without excuse. They're without excuse. It is written. You have no right to get into the gates of that city. You have no right to eat of the tree of life if you're not keeping His commandments. And yet, oh, what are you saying about that? You have no excuse. It's written. If you believe the one, why don't you believe the other? <coughs> I'm sure a lot of people are going to argue about this. They're going to call me all sorts of things. But is it going to change what God has written in His Word? I didn't make it up. I just read what the Word of God has to say. Now what are you going to do about it? Romans chapter 1, verse 21. 
Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves, verse 22, to be wise, they became fools, and changed, verse 23, the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things, he goes down to verse 25. He says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie. They changed God's holy day from Sunday to Sunday. They changed the truth into a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Don't tell me you haven't done it. Don't tell me people aren't doing it right now. <coughs> because I'll make a liar out of you come tomorrow morning when you see all the church bells ringing and all the people lining up behind the Pope. Most of the people in the churches today at some point in their life have recognized God for who He is. But what are they doing about it? Are they doing what God says to do? Are they keeping His commandments or not? Think about it. What are you doing with God? You recognize that He's a God, but are you treating Him as God? Or are you treating Him like you treat your parents? This narrative that we're reading in the book of Romans gives us the progression of people who have decided to travel the highway of the world, which is the highway of destruction, misery, judgment, and this highway is going to take them to hell. But before they take them to hell, guess what's going to happen? They all are going to become homosexual. And look at our country now. What's happening? If we read the rest of this narrative here in Romans chapter 1, they all have become homosexual. <coughs> but God doesn't want anybody to perish and go to hell. He created us to have fellowship with Him. But what are we doing with Him? Are we treating Him as God? Or some kind of a something else? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, or slow, as some men count slowness, but is long-suffering to usward, not wanting that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're not keeping the Sabbath, he says you need to start doing it, don't you? Isn't that what he says? Well, yeah, maybe you just went to church on Sunday, but when you read that verse in there, you know what God has said, no matter what that fake pastor is preaching. In his fake church, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. It's not God's church. It's just like a school somewhere. It's just like they're teaching their own doctrine. The doctrines of men, not the doctrines of God. The Bible declares that we are responsible people and we all have a free will and we need to decide what we must do for ourselves and we need to make sure of our own destination. Where are you going when this life is over? Whether it's over in the rapture or whether it's over when you die before the rapture. You might say, why would any person in right mind want to reject God and go to hell? Why would any man or woman want to hate their Creator? Well, could it be because they don't want to keep His commandments? Think about that. They just don't want to do what God says to do, huh? Romans chapter 1, verse 21. I'll be in and out of Romans a good bit in this message as we go along here this morning. Because that when they knew God, what did they do? They didn't glorify Him as God. They treated Him like something else. Neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Because what you're doing with God does something to you. It turned you away from God. You hate Him by what you're doing to Him. 
It all begins here in Romans. In these verses that I'm talking about. There, a lot of people overlook these verses. A lot of people say, oh, that's just for the homosexuals. That's not so. Look at the people in the churches that aren't keeping God's commandments. Whores. Prostitutes. They're better off than most of the people in the churches. They, at least they know they're not doing the right thing because they're slipping and sliding and sneaking and hiding what they do. The people in the churches are doing it outright in the face of God, aren't they? And then we look at the people and they say, well, this don't have nothing to do with me. But it does. It has everything to do with the person in Christ, in the churches today. Because verse 21 says, because that when they knew God. How many prostitutes know God? How many whores, robbers, and all these other <laughs> people know God? Oh yeah, they know there is a God. You know. But how many of them really know God? The people in the church, that's who's supposed to know God, isn't it? And it says that when they knew God, what did they do with Him? Come on now. We're people here now this morning. We're church people, aren't we? Oh my goodness. Are you going to put yourself in that category? <coughs> well, I'll say this much. Everyone in the churches at some point in their life knew God. Or they wouldn't be in church. <laughs> Just that simple. Even though they're not doing the right thing, they wouldn't be there if they didn't know there was a real God. Now the Greek word for know here means to be aware of or to perceive. So every person has perceived just about, I guess, who God is at some point in their life. Even those who are not in the churches have had a chance to do what's right and seek after God. And if that weren't the case, well, just this week I've seen these three drag queens riding on something or other, openly cursing Jesus. They had to know who God was to curse Jesus, His Son. Why would they do it if they didn't know who God was? Come on now. What are you doing but cursing God when you don't keep His Sabbath? I'm not doing what you say. I'll do what I want to do. What's the difference in you and them three drag queens in? We need to wake up People, even those who are not in the churches, as I said, they have probably known God. But people come up with a substitute for God and His Son. Because we see the real Jesus was probably born sometime after sundown on Thursday. Mark this down on your calendar. He was probably born some on Thursday, September the 26th in 3 B.C. <laughs> he was not born on what the world calls Christmas Day because this is the birthday of the pagan sun god. Always has been. And it always will be. The pagan sun god. They used it in Rome. They used it in Greece. And they used it when they were building the Tower of Babel with Tammuz and Nimrod. December 25th is the date of the festival of the sun god Tammuz and all these other false gods such as Ra in um, Egypt and Jupiter in the Greek or wherever. John the Baptist was born the day after Passover. <clears throat> and so Jesus had to have been born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now there are six months between both feasts, and we're told that Mary became pregnant six months after John's mother, Elizabeth, became pregnant. When Mary made the journey to see and assist her older cousin, well, let's turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Read the, read the thing in, in, in the Bible, in the Holy Word of God, in verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city named Galilee, named Nazareth, 
to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Verse, in verse 27. Now verse 31, Behold, the angel speaking to her, he says, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. The angel tells her what the name of the child is going to be, and she doesn't even know, or she isn't even pregnant at this point in time. And she's going to have a child, and they're going to call him Jesus. Verse 34, Then Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? How long is this going to happen? How am I going to have a baby? I ain't never had sex. <laughs> Verse 35, The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which thou shalt be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And verse 38, Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now she was saying that she was a virgin. She was also saying she had never had sex. And that is probably the very moment that the Spirit of God quickened the womb of Mary with Jesus. And she became pregnant with Jesus at that point. That's probably when she became pregnant. <laughs> oh, there will be some people out there that's going to say, Oh, you're crazy! That ain't what happened! It did this and it did that! Well, you can have your own theories on it then, can't you? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean, Emmanuel? Then we see this fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, she shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That makes Jesus God. You understand me this morning? That makes Jesus Christ God. God with us. Not way outside somewhere in space. Not in your mind somewhere else off in the world that you could conjure up, but with us. Think about that. Now after reading these verses, if you're having a hard time with Jesus being God, He has come in the flesh. A lot of church people, or churchy people, deny that He is God. Or how else? Ask yourself, how else can we have all this Christmas mess going on? If they knew that Jesus dwelt along with us, and if they knew that Jesus is God, why would they have a Santa Claus and Easter Bunny? Think about that. So they're denying the Christ. They're denying God with us. The Babylonian sun god worship was merged with Christianity under Constantine. But it was the Catholic Church who brought all this mess into the churches today. And it was the Catholic Church that changed the worship from Saturday, the Sabbath, to Sunday, because Sunday is the Sun God Day. That's the day to worship the Sun God. Sun Day. The day of the sun. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Jesus created the world. It says so right there. Verse 3, Who being in the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself, Jesus, purged our sins, 
sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus is God. And you don't get that through your head. That's why you can have your Santa Claus and Easter Bunny. You got him pictured as some myth or something that's not God. He's something else to you. He's not God. He's something that you're in control of. Because that when they knew God, you see there? When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. They became vain in their imaginations. They had the Santa Claus. They had their Easter Bunny. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into something made like unto corruptible man. Santa Claus. Easter Bunny. Four-footed beast. And all kinds of creeping things. You see it? It's right there as plain as the hand in front of your face. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God is here. And it's appearing. What are you doing with God? God has shown Himself in one way or another to us. And He has been fair to everyone. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Go back to Romans chapter 1 now. Verse 20 tells us, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. He's not a Santa Claus. He's not an Easter Bunny. The creation of the world shows He's clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. You go to church on Sunday, you're without excuse. You're going to stand before an Almighty God one day and you're going to have to give account for rejecting God and His dear Son. The Bible teaches that we can see the invisible things of God by understanding the things that are made. In Psalms 33, you don't have to turn there, Marie, but verse 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Me and Marie had this on our answering machine years ago. And people would call to tell us something. Oh, I didn't expect to get a sermon when I called you. It's not a sermon. That's glorifying our God as God. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You can hear God. You can see Him in everything that He has made. Just look around. He's everywhere. There has been no speech, and there has been no language where He cannot be heard. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20 again, for the invisible things of Him. I'm bringing this verse up over and over so you'll understand. For even the invisible things of Him are clearly seen from creation of the world, being understood by the things that are made. But verse 21 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The Word of God plainly teaches that God has provided a way for anyone to know Him. He is through the things that are made. Anyone can see these things. So you're making a decision not to keep His commandments. You're making a decision to serve false gods, idols, rather than the real God. You're making this plain, outright decision in how you're living your life and what you're doing. He is invisible to many, but even so, His eternal power and Godhead is clearly seen because that when they knew God, Verse 21 again. You see? When they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God. They didn't treat Him right. They treated Him like 
like I said, some people treat their parents. The God said, the Word of God says, in Jeremiah chapter 10, that we're not supposed to learn the way that, he, that the heathen do. Atheists, unbelievers, and all Christ rejectors who are putting up a tree every year, decorating it, and pursuing after Santa Claus in their homes, they're without excuse. The Bible says so. Jeremiah chapter 10. Hear the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver, with gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers. Does that sound to you like a Christmas tree? What it sounds to me like. It might have been something else back then, but that's what it is today, isn't it? They drag it into their home. They nail it in the front of their living room. And they go out and deck it out with silver and gold ornaments. And they place presents all underneath it. And they wouldn't give God a dime. That when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. They glorified the Santa Claus. Or an Easter Bunny or something else not God. They will someday die. People doing this. They're someday going to die and fall headlong into hell. And they're going to be followed with their ungodly children. And their ungodly children are going to be cursing them the whole way. Why didn't you tell us the truth? You're without excuse because you knew God. And you didn't teach us like the Bible said you were supposed to do. Talk to us about it in the way. When we rise up, when we sit down, when we walk along the way, you were supposed to tell us about God and you didn't do it. Now your children are in hell with you. path that leads to God there are two paths to travel you go by the path that leads to God or you go by the path that leads to hell which path are you going by this morning when we drop down to Romans chapter 1 and verse 28 now even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. This is the part where they become homosexual. They change the truth of God into a lie. And then they didn't want to think about God because when they got to think about God, they knew they was wrong. And they didn't want to be wrong. They wanted God to be wrong. So He is and He doesn't even exist. He's not real. We created ourselves. Billions of years ago, the earth did this and the sun did that. So they teach them about a false conspiracy called evolution. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, meaning they simply didn't want God meddling in their business. They didn't even want God in their mind. It started with them being unthankful and not honoring God as to who He is. And that word honor means to value, just like it says to honor your parents or to value them. And that loss of value is what the devil used to lead them happily on their way to hell. How can anyone not value their own parents or God? But when they begin to dishonor God, they begin to dishonor their parents as well. When the scriptures speak of honoring your parents, it means to value them and treat them. And I'll give you an example. In uh, John chapter 19, this is Jesus, what he does with his mother. While he's hanging on the cross, what's going to happen to his mother is on his mind. Verse 25, John chapter 19. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, 
and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Verse 26, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Verse 27, Then saith he to the disciple, This disciple he's talking about is John, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. He took care of Jesus' mother because Jesus just told him to take care of my mama because I'm leaving. What are our children doing with their parents today? Are they honoring their parents? Yeah. Even while Jesus is dying on the cross, he wanted to show us that we should honor and have concern for our parents' well-being even after we're gone from their home. We're supposed to still honor them and respect them. I wonder how many today out there honor their parents and God. But after reading the Bible through and through well over a hundred times myself, nowhere in that verse is anything close to it that puts any stipulation on what they should first meet or what people should think is acceptable. So if you're judging your parents by what you think they've done or they shouldn't have done, you better understand that God is their judge, not you. You're supposed to honor them. That's all. Not judge them. Honor them. Can you live just as well without your parents? Maybe. But can you get to heaven without Jesus who said his words would never pass away? Think about that. He'll be here forever. And what you do with your parents, he sees. Because he's God. And he knows what you're doing. So many today are arrogant and self-righteous. They don't need their parents. And they've consent. They've convinced themselves that they don't need a Savior. And they don't even want God in their knowledge. They don't like God. They don't want to think about Him. So they mistreat their aging parents. And they think of God the same way. And so they mistreat Him too. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God. You see how much clearer it becomes when you explain it out what What's really happening in the world today? They glorified Him not as God, but neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. So the Bible says they became unthankful to God. Professing themselves to be wise, verse 22, they became fools. These people were unthankful and they were reluctant to honor God because of they because of that they became foolish. But also they became vain or empty or silly because they had silly imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They come up with all these science fiction things today. Silliness. Look at some of these characters they portray and some of these games that they're playing out there today and what these characters look like. All silliness, isn't it? And look at what the world's doing with their silliness today. The lost and the wicked world today are living foolishly. And a lot of people worship sports and sex. And they glorify these people that's in these movies and uh, doing these sports things like they're some kind of God or something. Think about that. And look at the people that thrive on greed and corruption. They practice maliciousness and covetousness and they diminish the sacredness of the family. 
They want to get rid of marriage. And when they do, they think they're getting rid of God, I guess. They honor the immoral and the heathen. They reject Christ. For the invisible things of Him, Romans 1.20, are clearly seen from the creation of the world. Think about that. They know what they're doing. And they got in their mind, they just don't care. I'm going to do all I can do to God. Headlines on MSN this morning, there was one of the little pictures up there. There's a woman sitting there. She knew Jesus. She just wanted to make him angrier, saying she didn't know who he was. Isn't that what I said earlier? Yeah. Yeah. When they knew God, they glorified Him not. I'm going to talk to Him just like He's somebody I know. Just like a man. They glorified Him not as God, but they became vain in their imagination. And then they'll sit around and they'll watch all these police detective movies and all these murders. And they got this um, investigation channel on there now where they investigate stuff. Oh, these people love to do that kind of stuff. Oh, I want to see what happens here. I want to see how many people gets killed. I want to see how many people gets chopped up and maimed and all this other stuff. Drop down to Romans 1, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. If you get pleasure in watching that kind of garbage, <laughs> you better look at that verse again. That verse is putting you in with this group of people. And you know the judgment of God. Why do you want to watch this mess? It's going to corrupt you. It's going to corrupt your mind. And you're going to turn away from God in the end time. People have pleasure in watching other people who commit sin, adulterers, homosexuals are brought right into their homes. And they commit all these evil deeds because people welcome them right into their home through that TV set. And that makes them guilty of the same thing. Isn't that what the verse is saying? That makes you guilty of doing the same thing because you have pleasure and watching that kind of garbage. Have you also become a fool in this idolatry, sinful pride, pride that means more to you than God? People by nature are full of pride, arrogance, self-righteousness. But you have to redefine where you are. Where are you with God? And the truth in His Word. Romans 1.23 says they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Uh, there's a Santa Claus. That's one example. There's an Easter Bunny. And he's dressed up looking like a man. That's another example, isn't it? And then it says, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. <laughs> Look at the thing that they're calling God today. They have a distorted view of God and they change the glory of the uncorruptible God. Verse 25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator. Think about that. So they straight away explain away God and His Word. How? with their silly thinking, their worldly philosophies, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They go down to Walmart and spend thousands of dollars every Christmas, but they don't give God a dime. They go into debt and pay for what they spend at Walmart around Christmas for the next two or three years. In the meantime, God's churches are in ruin. No one's there to keep out, help pay the bills at the churches and keep God's house. And they say it's all God's fault because if God wanted it any better, He'd do something about it. 
Why did they say that? Verse 21, because when they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God. You see, they put Him on the level as man. Are you traveling down the wrong path? After the time that you said you knew God, are you still traveling down the wrong path? And you said you knew God? You said you became born again? You said that you was a Christian? Some people even deny God's Word and the Bible and the invisible things are clearly seen. And they deny that. Well, where did God come from? Whoa. A person asked me one time, where did God come from? I said, well, if I tell you where God came from, would that be enough to answer your question? You're not going to ask me anymore. They said, sure, I just want to know where God came from. You tell me that, we'll be done with it. Oh, I said, okay, I'll show you in the Bible. It says God came from Teman. And I let it go at that. And I went on to do something else. And they said, well, wait, well, wait a minute, where's Teman at? I said, wait a minute, you told me just tell you where God came from, and that would be the end of it. So that's the end of it. I don't want to talk about it no more. Read the Bible. If you read the Bible... What's the Bible going to tell you? The Bible is going to tell you that God created the heavens and the earth. God always was. God always will be. There wasn't a chance when, and there wasn't a time when God wasn't. God has always been. God was never born. Jesus just became flesh. He has always existed. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, let us Make man in our image, after our likeness. Who's God talking about there? Who is the us? Who's the our? In Genesis 1.26. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has always existed. Now the rich man in Luke chapter 16, I got a message on that coming up soon. So I'm not going to get too far into it. But in hell, he begged Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his five brethren unless they come to that same place of torment. He found out. Now, there are a lot of people says that uh, story in Luke chapter 16 about the two men, Lazarus and the rich man. A lot of people say that's a parable. But Jesus didn't say it was a parable. He said it was a, like a real story of two different men and what their destinations was. It says the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment. In other words, the first thing he did, he woke up one morning and found himself in hell. He opened up his eyes and he was in hell. So when you die, it's like going to sleep and waking right back up in another world. Will the world you wake up in be hell or will it be heaven? He says Lazarus was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which at the time was heaven. That's how they defined heaven at the time. But people, I'm going to tell you something. Abraham said if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. People are good at blame shifting. But if you go to hell, it's going to be no one's fault but your own. Adam and Eve both sinned. Adam blamed God, saying, The woman you gave to be with me. Read it. Yeah, Genesis chapter 3. It's your fault, God, because that woman you gave to be with me, she gave it to me and I ate it. But when it came to the woman, God looked at the woman, she said, Well, my fault. The devil tricked me. Or the serpent tricked me. But she's going to blame the serpent. <laughs> Who did the serpent blame? He hates God. And so, has the devil tricked you? Has the devil caused you not to believe God? It's typical for humans to try to shift the blame. If we don't if we can't shift the blame, then we try to cover up our sin. Well, what do you mean I 
do so and so. Well, Cain killed his brother Abel. And when God asked him about his brother Abel, that's not my job to watch out for my brother. I'm not his keeper. And you need to ask him. Don't ask me. I don't know nothing about it. Liar. Liar. You can't blame anybody for your mistakes. I stand before God. I'm guilty this morning. I confess I'm guilty. I deserve to go to hell. If there's anybody on this earth that deserved to go to hell, I did. But let me tell you something. You do too. But we have all sinned. We all fell short of the glory of God. And I'm, I'm glad that we don't go to heaven by our good works because I'd never make it. Because I'd never be good enough to make it to heaven. I'm so thankful today that we have Jesus. You just don't know how thankful I am. You may look at the Bible and you may understand all these allegories that are written. You may understand all these parables and all these wise sayings. But if you miss Christ, you're going to miss the whole purpose of the Bible. You're going to miss the whole purpose of creation if you miss Christ. He's the beginning and He's the end of all the biblical revelation that you can have. He says in Revelation 1, 7, Behold, He cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Even so. Amen. Then He says in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. The Almighty. This is Jesus. He's saying, I'm God. He says, I'm Almighty God. Look at that. What is your problem this morning? The writer of Hebrews showcases us how to examine the Scripture and reveal Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time that we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape, verse 3, if we neglect so great a salvation? He says in verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put in all things subjection under him, he left nothing that is put in, under him. But now yet we see not all things, because now comes the end. Now comes our time. What are we going to do? You have a decision to make. Am I going to trust Jesus as my Savior? Am I going to admit to God that I'm a sinner and ask him to forgive my sins? Am I going to realize that Christ paid for them? Can I rely upon Jesus as my Savior for Him to pay for my sin? Because of your sin, you deserve to go to hell. But Jesus died on the cross. He was buried and He rose again. Your sin is paid for when you put your trust in Jesus. The important thing is that you must believe on the Lord Jesus. Confess Him with your mouth. And not every eye closed and every mouth shut and no one looking around. You must confess Him with your mouth. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if that pastor tells you every head bowed, every eye closed, and no one looking around, you stand up in that church and say, you are a fake. You are not real. Because God's Word says we must confess Jesus with our mouth. He's a fake pastor. And if you're sitting under Him, then you're just as guilty as He is. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. 
Paul and Silas were in prison for preaching the gospel. There was an earthquake because they were singing and praising God and all their chains fell off. The jailer come jumping in to the midst of the prison thinking all the prisoners escaped and Paul says, bring a light here. We're still here. We, none of us left. We don't want to see you get hurt. Because we know if we leave, they will probably kill you for letting us escape. The jailer, he didn't know what to do with all that. And so the Bible says in verse 30 of Acts chapter 16, he brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do you have to do to be saved? Read the next verse. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thou house. Now you can trust the Pope all you want. You can trust your pastor. You can do all these things you want to do. <laughs> but if you don't do what the Bible says... You're going to hell. Because the Bible gave us a way to get saved. We can learn the different types of prayers. We can read through the pages of the Bible. And we can extract all the content. But until we do what the Bible says, none of us going to do any good. Until we do what God says to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to do seven sacraments. You don't have to be baptized. The only thing you have to do is believe on Jesus and you can be saved. Right now, this morning. So if you're out there this morning watching this on YouTube or something, or this evening or whenever you're watching it, you don't have to do nothing. Right there where you're at, on your knees, you can bow before Him and admit to Him that you're a sinner and you need Him. Lord, I confess You as my Savior and I believe in my heart that You are the Christ. And the Bible says that's all you have to do and you'll be saved. Oh yeah, you probably want to go to a church somewhere and get baptized. You probably want to start doing the right thing because that Spirit of God's going to change you. It's going to want you to do things. Amen. But to be saved... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's all. The Word of God conveys theological truths about the Godhead, about soul, about sin, the world to come. But you can't re you you cannot ignore Jesus. And once you become a born again Christian, if there is such a thing as that, I call them called out ones. Because we're not titled with labels in. We're called out of God. And that's just what we are. We're just called out from, from the world. By God. And if you're a called out one, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. <laughs> you will keep His commandments. If you're a called out one of God... You're on your way to heaven. And you're going to keep His commandments. And John was being led by an angel. And one of the things that John did may surprise you, but he got so encapsulated with what he was doing at, at a couple of times, he actually got down to kneel in front of an angel. And verse ni chapter 19 and verse 10 tells us about it. And I fell at His feet to worship Him. But listen to what this angel tells him. He said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so, what are you going to have? Are you going to do what God says now or are you going to do what, you know, what you've been doing? I'm going to give you this one last verse to think about this morning. Jesus is the Word of Life. In the Bible, He's the Logos of God. The true Imagio Dia. Concealed in the Old Testament. And He is revealed in the New Testament. So He's both in the Old and the New Testament. This is the Word of God. In John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus says, 
If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So whatever you ask me, I'm going to do for you, if you abide in me. He says in verse 8, Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. If you're not bearing fruit, are you his disciple? Think about that then. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. Verse 10, Marie. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see there? Don't put me under the category of saying, I'm a law keeper because I have to keep his commandments. Put me in another category. I'm called out of God. And that's why I keep his commandments. Because I am a called out one of God. Whether that be a Christian in your eyes or a saved person in someone else's eyes. Whatever the terminology you want to use, I'm called out by God, are you? If you're not, you're not going to heaven. And if you think you are, you're not keeping His commandments, you aren't. I wonder, will you believe on Jesus today and confess Him as your Lord and Savior, as the Bible teaches us to do? And Jesus said, abide in me. And my word abides in you. And this is what Jesus talking in verse 10 there. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So think about that. Where are you at this morning? Are you doing what God says to do? Or are you doing what some man told you you should be doing? I can only tell you one thing. You're going to be judged for what knowledge that you have. And today, ask yourself, are you going up in the rapture? Are you going up in the rapture? Or are you going to be left behind? We're going to have also call now. <clears throat> Will you come to Jesus this morning and say, Lord, I believe you're the Son of God. I want, I want you to be my Savior. Thank you.